Hi, Mary. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to our call today on Equity Impact Zones, New Jersey. Um, it looks like it's just you right now. Some other folks may trickle in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. And then uh, we can go ahead. Uh, there'll be time towards the end where we can answer any questions you may have brought with you today. So I am going to go ahead and, oh, and I see the thumbs up, great. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Stuart and we will kick things off and just thank you in advance for being here. Great, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Stuart Allen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Chief Marketing and Advancement Officer here at Mental Health America at the National Office. Um, we're so excited to be with you today um, and share a little bit more. Um, this is our call focused on our Equity Impact Zone, New Jersey, just an informational call. We um, opened up the um, opportunity for funding uh, about a week ago and just wanted to make this time to give you sort of an overview of how the Equity Impact Zone project came about, a little bit about our data findings, and then share um, some more about the grant process. Um, and then from there, uh, answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I'll hop over to Mental Health America. So we um, are we are calling, a, this is the national office. We have over 143 affiliates from across the country. And our work is really anchored in direct service, public education, research, advocacy, and public policy. We focus on um, early prevention, intervention, um, and upstream. So this opportunity is coming from our national office. Mental Health America is committed to anchoring all of our work and lived experience. And as I mentioned, we're focused on prevention, um, knowing that prevention mental health can save lives and reduce stress um, and is uh, our unique opportunity here. Additionally, all of our work, it, uh, through line of all of our work is equity and anchor our time on innovation to ensure um, we know that crisis is not a win. And so we uh, continue to think of ways to be innovative in the mental health space, including projects like this. So the Equity Impact Zone project, um, we are thrilled to be here today. This is an opportunity that was made possible with the support from Otsuka America Pharmaceuticals. And what we're seeking to do and seeking to address is that we all know that communities know best what they need and how to solve the unique needs that they face. However, the solutions that aim to close the mental and social health equity gaps they face due to longstanding systemic barriers are often unfunded or underfunded or come with too much red tape. But these community-driven, community-led solutions really are the ways that communities can help to address the problems and unique opportunities that they face in their communities. And what is really needed is a catalytic investment. So our solution to that is to provide resources of funding as well as technical assistance to uplift and support those community-driven solutions with uh, multi-year funding that can help break systemic barriers that impede the progress and the change that you hope and need and know in your community. Um, this first cohort, we're really excited to be launching in New Jersey. And these direct investments are, um, this is the first of our equity impact zones. We're hoping will be an evidence base for local solutions to mental health equity and help us to understand kind of a regional investment and sustainable um, scaling that we can do across the country. So the approach that we're taking here is to um, launch what is trying to be a streamlined RFP process. So we know a lot of times access to funding, half of the challenge is how funding opportunities are set up. There's a lot of questions and you know, 14 pages of things to do that we've really tried to make the process as streamlined as possible. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but our approach is essentially to um, do an RFP process and select local organization or organizations um, to support a community-based and community-led strategy, strategy and really partner together with you to drive um, and support a specific mental health equity issue that you're seeking to address. These funding and areas will be called the equity impact zones. And specifically, this opportunity is seeking to, for applicants that are in Burlington County or the city of Trenton who are 
either currently working there or aim to and hope to um, work and support individuals there to address mental health and social equity gaps, um, either with new project or existing projects um, to improve the well-being of those communities in New Jersey. And the funding will be multi-year and can be anywhere from 100 to 330,000 per year. Um, Great, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, um, Maddie, who can share a little bit more about the New Jersey Community Assessment findings. Awesome, thank you, Stuart. Um, I'm Maddie Reiner, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Senior Director of Population Health at MHA. Um, so one of the first steps of this process was for us to conduct a high-level community needs assessment um, to really just start to understand where within Burlington, and Mercer counties, we were seeing high rates of mental distress and what factors might be contributing to that distress. Um, so the findings of that community assessment are included on our website, but we just wanted to take some time today to give a brief overview of them and to lend more context to how we got there. Next slide, please. Uh, so first, where did this data come from? Um, half of the data that we used for this community needs assessment was collected through the MHA online screening program, which is a collection of 11 free, anonymous, confidential, and clinically validated mental health screening tools for people to use online. So these are the same tools that would be used to screen individuals for mental health conditions in a provider's office, but we put them on our website because we knew that people were likely to turn to the internet to search for mental health information and supports on their own, often long before they um, were able to bring these concerns to a provider's office. So when someone seeks mental health help on the internet and finds our website, they're able to take a screen and receive immediate results and resources to support them. And on our end, we collect the de-identified data from the screening tool itself, as well as several optional demographic questions. Um, and these demographic questions include location information like state and zip code, which is how we've been able to use the data for community risk assessments, but it also includes detailed demographic information and several questions that allow for people to write in free responses about what they're experiencing, all of which I'll talk through as part of this needs assessment. Next slide. So for this community assessment, we first took a deep dive into that screening data within these two counties in New Jersey to see where there was greatest mental health risk from people taking those screens. Um, so here you'll see we've mapped overall mental health risk, which we defined as people receiving a positive result on any of those 11 mental health screening tools. Um, and so what we're looking at with this map is the number of people getting a positive result per 100,000 people in the population, um, where dark purple um, zip codes areas are um, areas where there was the highest number of people receiving a positive mental health screen screening tool results per 100,000, um, and light purple is with the lowest number of people receiving that positive result per 100,000. Um, and you'll also see that in the column of the table labeled number per 100K. So really what this is just showing us is where there is a disproportionately high number of people experiencing mental health conditions based on the zip codes population. Um, that can sometimes skew away from showing high risk in heavily populated areas like the city of Trenton. So we also looked at which zip codes had the highest percentage of people scoring at risk, which you can see in that far right column of the table labeled percent at risk. Um, and so that's really telling us of all the people from these zip codes who came onto our website and took a screen, um, which had the highest percentage of people score at risk for a mental health condition. So not necessarily based on the population, but just of everyone from there who came on and took a screen um, who scored at risk. So once we did this full assessment um, of risk um, on both metrics, we identified that the geographic areas within these two counties with the highest risk were Bordentown, Burlington, Mount Holly, Browns Mills, and then the city of Trenton. Next slide. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we also have a lot of demographic 
information to pull from. So once we started to look um, demographically at people who were coming on, taking screens and scoring at risk, we saw that um, consistent with what we usually see in our screening data, youth under age 18 were screening at risk for a mental health condition at higher rates than any other age group. Um, and then within these high risk areas, individuals who identified as LGBTQ+, um, Hispanic or Latino, or as more than one race, screened at risk for a mental health condition at higher rates than the general state population as well. So all populations that could be a focus for a mental health equity project. Our demographic questions also allow us to dig into what people are saying is affecting their mental health at the time of taking a screen. Um, so in all of these higher risk areas, we saw a really consistent story of trauma, grief or loss, and financial problems. So in this lower table, we see all of these higher risk areas, um, Browns Mills, Burlington, Trenton, and Bordentown all had a higher percentage of people identifying as trauma survivors than the New Jersey state average. Um, especially we can see in Browns Mills where 36% of screeners identified as trauma survivors. That was 13% higher than the state average. Um, and when we asked people what the top three things contributing to their mental health problems were, um, in this top table, we saw a higher percentage reported financial problems being a main concern in nearly every area um, than the New Jersey state average. Um, more people reported grief or loss in each of these high risk areas than the state average. Um, and then we also saw themes of higher rates of loneliness or isolation and reported relationship problems, which we sometimes see in our screening data as a proxy for things like domestic violence or family conflict. And then here on the right, I've just pulled some quotes from individual screeners that were really consistently reported in these high risk areas um, and were really emblematic of the concerns people were reporting, like stress around job loss, financial pressures around supporting their families, um, family conflict because of substance use in many cases, and a lot of people very consistently reporting struggling with past abuse or other traumatic experiences. Next slide. All right, so that's what we saw in our screening data. Um, our research team also took a deeper dive into other data sets like census data, um, CDC, and then specifically New Jersey data out of um, several state departments to get a sense of risk outside of just our screening population. Um, and I'll run through these quickly because I know many of you are probably familiar with um, some of these data points. So here is just a look at education data. Um, this is showing on the left the percentage of people whose highest education level was a high school diploma, and on the right the percentage of people whose highest education level was less than a high school diploma. Um, here we can see many zip codes within Trenton um, in that red color. Um, so 30 to 40 percent of people in Trenton, depending on which zip code we look into, um, had a high school diploma as their highest level of education, and about 14 to 30% had less than a high school diploma. Um, and then particularly in Browns Mills, which we also see um, in red on in the right map, um, about 20 to 30% of people reported that their highest level of education was less than a high school diploma. Next slide. We also looked at unemployment and incarceration rates. Um, so for unemployment, again, we're seeing several zip codes in Trenton, um, as well as that Browns Mills area um, in that red color. So in Trenton, we saw between a 7 and 13 percent unemployment rate, um, depending on the zip code. And in Browns Mills area, we saw around an 8 percent unemployment rate. Um, and we know the New Jersey state average um, rate is around 5%. So each of these areas in um, that orange or red color are elevated over the state average. Um, and then for incarceration rates here, we're really seeing the Burlington area, Browns Mills and Trenton, um, all highlighted red again. Um, 
each of which have the highest incarceration rates per 100,000 of all zip codes in these two counties in New Jersey. Um, and the highest was in the Trenton area, where the incarceration rate ranges from about 500 to almost 1,200 per 100,000 people by zip code. Next slide. We also wanted to understand the landscape of available mental health services in these two counties. So here we just have a screenshot from the SAMHSA treatment locator um, and where we wanted to see where there were physical mental health or substance use facilities for people. Um, and here we can see that there are some clustered um, services in Trenton. Um, and then really there's kind of a gap in, in physical facilities for mental health or substance use um, between Trenton and the, the Camden area outside of Philadelphia. Um, so in Burlington, we see there's only about one dot right in the, the city of Burlington, um, and it's just coded as a substance use provider. Um, in that Bordentown area, we don't see any physically available mental health or substance use facilities. Um, and then same story in Browns Mills as Burlington. There are a couple dots there, but they're really only color-coded as substance use facilities. And so that may explain um, a lot of the need that we're starting to see, especially in our screening data in um, that Bordentown, Burlington, Browns Mills area. Next slide. Um, and finally, we ran correlations just at the zip code level between our screening data and outside data sets to um, understand neighborhood factors that increased or decreased the chance that someone um, would screen at risk for a mental health condition. Um, so from that, we saw that areas where there were higher rates of people getting routine annual checkups or um, cholesterol or other preventative screenings were correlated with a lower chance of people screening at risk for a mental health condition. Um, so that indicates that higher access to health care or more emphasis on preventative care in general can be beneficial to mental health. Um, we also saw from those correlations that areas with higher rates of chronic kidney disease, stroke, asthma, and COPD were all correlated with a higher chance of screening at risk for a mental health condition. Um, we also know many of these conditions are more prevalent in low income areas, so this can be a representation just as of lower access to care or neighborhood or socioeconomic effects that impact both physical and mental health. Um, so an impact topic area could either be reduction in these chronic health conditions or um, anything that can, can lessen or mitigate those neighborhood effects. Um, and then as we saw in the previous slides, we really focused in on um, poor education outcomes, lower household income, and higher unemployment incarceration rates. Um, we saw that those were correlated with higher mental health risk. And finally, communities that um, reported experiencing trauma, violence, grief or loss, and financial problems and loneliness um, were also showing up as those higher risk mental health areas. Um, and all of those areas were reporting those factors more often than the average in the state of New Jersey. So um, very quick rundown, but that's what we found from our community risk assessment. And now I will turn it back over to talk about the grant application process. Thank you so much, Maddie. Hi, everyone. My name is America Paredes. She, her. I am our chief social impact officer here at Mental Health America and very happy to be with you all today. Um, so we're going to go over our grant application process. We have tried to make it as easy as possible, but there are primarily three steps. Next slide, please. And the three steps are somewhat simple. Um, it depends on your level of ease through all of these processes. The first is essentially our eligibility assessment, which was opened on April 22nd, and we are receiving, um, you can go in and take the eligibility assessment through May 20th at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, that eligibility assessment is really your gateway to determine if you will be able to move forward to step two, which requires for you to submit a concept proposal, which is opened again from April 22nd through May 20th at 5 p.m. Eastern. And then an invitation to submit writ written proposals will be provided uh, in early June. And the third and final step is the submission of a full written proposal which will occur from mid-June through July 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern. 
It is important to remember that these three steps must be completed for you to move forward in this process. Next slide, please. So the eligibility assessment, like I said, is the first step that helps you really move forward in determining if your organization is eligible for this opportunity. There are um, very important requirements for this opportunity. And so when you go into the eligibility assessment, you will be asked to complete a series of questions. Um, if you qualify, you will be invited to submit a concept proposal. Next slide, please. And that concept proposal essentially will take you to a, a platform. You will be receiving an email that gives you access to this concept proposal platform where you will be required to respond to 12 questions. Uh, in this question, what, uh, this questionnaire, what we've done is broken it down into two parts. One is um, eight narrative responses, and there are four other questions that are yes or no uh, questions. Um, concept proposals, again, are going to be accepted from April 22nd through May 20th, and we're going to review them in early June. If you have questions about all of this, we do have a contact person that will uh, will share their email address later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go over a little bit about the formats for the concept proposal submission. Uh, because we want to make this process as easy as possible, you do have the option of selecting any one of the following formats to submit your responses for the narrative-based concept proposal questions. So that means you can use a written format, you can use Google Docs, Word, anything to create your responses in one document that you can upload um, for the eight narrative questions or you could choose to create video responses. For this, what you would essentially do is create one large video that um, addresses all of the narrative questions, um, about 30 to 90 seconds in length for each narrative question. The idea is if you aren't really great at writing, we don't want that to be a barrier. You can simply submit something that is um, speaking to all of the things that we are asking about in video, which is great. And the third option is um, the presentation. You can use PowerPoint, Google Doc, uh, Decks, or Slideshows, Canva. There are a variety of options for you to utilize. But again, what we would ask is that you would take time to create responses uh, for the deck. For instance, you would use one to two slides per narrative question and upload that entire file within the platform. Um, and then for all formats, you would be required to respond to questions 9 through 12 directly in the grant portal before submitting. It is very easy to use. And ideally, what we want is for you to select the best format that works with uh, whatever you have available to you. Uh, again, if you have questions, we will go into that a little bit later. Next slide, please. One of the things that we want you to really consider when you're creating uh, your proposal, your concept proposal for us, is in addressing uh, the social drivers of mental health. This is question 11 within that portal, and you will be asked to select which of these issues you will be addressing within your concept proposal. And if you have never heard about social drivers of mental health, we are sharing the link here so that you can learn a little bit more about it. But the idea is that there is a connection between all of these different pieces um, of environment, of different issues that may influence and impact our mental health, everything from access to adequate and nutritious food, all the way to maternal mental health or environmental pollution. So ideally, what we want you to do is really think carefully about how the solution that you're creating for your community is addressing these drivers that are to ultimately influence the well-being of your communities. So please take a look at that link and learn more about that and see where you fit in with that. Next slide, please. The second piece that we hope that you really take um, close attention to is the New Jersey Community Assessment findings that Maddie went over. This is a broad overview that is provided on our general website so that you can learn more about it. You can um, listen back to this recording as well to really understand how you can utilize this information 
in creating your concept proposal, thinking through what the data is telling us is occurring in these communities and how your solution may be able to address those in the long term. Next slide. And if your concept proposal moves to step three, what will happen is that you will be invited to submit a full written proposal. And this will be a unique opportunity for um, a few organizations who really have met um, all of the criteria that have been outlined and are providing innovative solutions in communities that ultimately will help to drive change in that community. So for the written proposal, the folks that are invited will be required to complete a full written document, including a budget narrative. Prior to submitting this proposal, applicants will have an opportunity to meet with the Mental Health America team to help shape their proposal and include um, some information about the evaluation outcomes and outputs that we would like to see. And that is very unique to this opportunity so that we can really work together to help uh, create something that will be very useful in those communities. The written proposal period will occur in early June and the submissions are due on July 19th. Next slide. And so we have an opportunity here for you all to ask us some questions about this opportunity. Um, if you do have questions, you can always email us as well at specialprojects at mhanational.org. Um, Harper, I'm gonna let you take the lead in managing questions, or would you like for me to do that? I can jump on in, thanks America. Um, Mary, I, this is not need to be formal by any means, but I want uh, you to feel free to come off mute if you have any questions. Uh, also, you can type them in the chat if that's easier for you, but wanted to give you the space to ask any questions since uh, you are on the call with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, am I the only outsider on this? So, because I don't want to be too selfish with my time. <laughs> no, it's, you are the only one right now. So please okay. take all the time, you have 30 minutes and you are welcome to use all of it. <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll use 30, but first, I just want to say thank you for the streamline process. I love this. Um, and I love the idea. You admittedly, you're the first group that I've worked with who have added this concept of the, the video application. I will not be the one to use that, but what a what a great idea. What a great idea. Um, so a couple out of the gate questions, um, if you don't mind. How many awards do you plan um on uh, issuing, uh, assuming that the applications are there, you know, what is the, what is the ceiling for the number of awards? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you'll see that, I'm just going to try and pull up the slide again, but I think I can just kind of reference it and then you can flip back through if you need to. But um, we are awarding up to $330,000 and it may be uh, a couple projects, it may be a single project. It really depends on the applications that we get and um, what you all ask for. As if you get to the uh, concept proposal round, that'll be an opportunity for you to kind of share your ideas with us and let us know what you're thinking. So it really is uh, nice that the way this is formatted to really uh, work with you all who are applying and make sure the project or program you're proposing uh, that we can support it, whether that means um, $100,000 or $330,000. Uh, again, that is the top of it, but we are. So it's, it's driven by that 330. So it's driven that, by the 330. That is the ceiling. Yep, that Got is it. the ceiling. Got it. Um, and let me just see. I have a quite a couple of my questions were answered during the presentation. So you guys did an awesome job with that. Um, and the one thing that I, ha I haven't seen, I, I read through what was circulated, the links that were circulated with the invitation for today's call, and I may have just missed it. Um, are you, so our projects are, our, our role within the projects is really from the coordination of the community um, service provider level. So we're at the coordinating level and bringing together more of a convener. And I'm just curious, is this for 
is this limited to the actual service providers or is the is a convening model um, obviously supported by successes and things of that in the you know um, as the um, the capacity of us as an organization are they being permitted or is this just service provider I skipped all over the place with my question so if I need to repeat it more succinctly I will you're you're all you're all right um i'm gonna rephrase the question back to you to make sure i'm understanding but it sounds like you're wondering um and i'm wondering if you saw some language we had about community impact boards um wondering if you're asking if your role is really to be the convener and bring all the different stakeholders together or is it more the service provider element is that your question right it's is as a convener would we be um permitted or qualified to apply Stuart and America, feel free to jump in, but I'm going to. Yeah, I'll take I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a very good question, Mary. Ideally, we would want to really be able to have a service provider submit and they could do it along with you as a convener. But it is that really direct service provision that we're aiming for. Um, part of the project also requires at a later time for you to create a community impact board. So having the support of a convener who can not only support the program side of the work is really important, but then also be able to drive some of those functions that are needed to create connections and community will also be very critical. So I think you have to think carefully on how you would be able to submit. Uh, the one thing that is important is if an organization is coming in, like two organizations are partnering to submit a proposal, both have to be eligible. They both have to have completed the eligibility assessment. Okay. And only one organization would actually submit the concept proposal. And is there, um, are there limitations on the budgeting for the sub submit from the organization submitting and the convener? So, so essentially we would come in as a sub then based on this model, right? Correct. So um, is the, are there limitations on the percentages that can go to the sub for the convening within the budget? I would say yes, but we don't have a percentage at this time, but that's a very good question. So it would be based on the model and, yes. and such, okay. Yep. And I'll just add those more detailed questions will come actually in step three. So for the concept proposal, it's great you're thinking about this, but we'll just kind of ask for general uh, info around funding. But there'll be more details if you are to advance to the third step. And um, of course, we'll do those conversations with Middle North America before submitting. So uh, okay. we can get those answered. Yeah. Okay. No, that's helpful. It just helps me where my brain is going here. Um, and then I guess the only other question I would have is, are you anticipating um, a large number of applicants um, or is that not something that you've really gauged at this point? I think we are anticipating um, interest, uh, but the thing that will distinguish how many applications we receive is how many organizations are eligible based on the criteria that are part of the three-step process. Okay. okay. All right. Very great. good questions, Mary. Those are my only questions. And that's only on a half a cup of tea this morning. I really, <laughs> I picked a bad week to give up coffee. I'll tell you what I'm thinking here. <laughs> well, thank you either way for joining us and having, um, you know, some, some very interesting questions at the early hour so that we can get folks uh, acclimated to what this project is and hopefully get a lot of interest in it. So please share with the community folks that you are connected to. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is great. This is great. I think this is wonderful. The data around Brown's Mills always interests me because of the joint base. So, um, yeah, you know, yeah. there's a, there's a lot of stuff in the background there that obviously, um, you know, impacts this horrible, horrible, but complete data set that you shared. And so here we are sharing uh, the email address that folks can reach out to if they have additional questions and um, the links to the different um, landing pages for the instructions for this project. 
uh, the eligibility assessment tool, uh, and ultimately the main kind of website where you can get a, a bunch more information, you can download content, um, but please reach out if other questions come up. Uh, we are here and ready to respond as we are available. So thank, thank you. you all. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. And the recording is going to be shared, you said? It will be shared and it will live on the website as well so others can access. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's time and answering my questions. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Mary. And just Great. to know, I popped the email in the chat. So if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll get back to you. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great thank day. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.